Welcome to the Trinity's Podcast, where we explore theories about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you love God enough to think about Him? Episode 153, Mormons Seeing the Man Behind the Curtain, Part 1. If you are really great and powerful, you keep your promises. Do you presume to criticize the great Oz? You ungrateful creatures think yourselves lucky that I'm giving you audience tomorrow instead of 20 years from now. Oh. The great Oz has spoken. Oh. Pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. The great Oz has spoken. Who are you? Oh, I, I, I am the great and powerful Wizard of Oz. I yes. don't believe you. No, I'm afraid it's true. There's no other wizard except me. You humbug! Yeah. Yes, it's exactly so. I'm a humbug. Oh, you're a very bad man. Part 1. My History with Mormonism. In this episode, I'm going to talk about something that we haven't talked about before on the Trinity's podcast, and that is Mormonism, or as they prefer to be called, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, or LDS. If you're not familiar with Mormonism, it's really a fascinating phenomenon, and I still remember when I first found out about it. To make a long story short, I grew up as an evangelical kid in Dallas, Texas, and when I first found out about Mormonism, I think I had met a few friends in Dallas who were Mormons. They seemed like very nice people. I got really curious about it. I remember going to the library and finding some books about it and following up on some things. What's this? They claim that they have a newer sort of Bible, a new divine revelation, a new scripture. What's this? They claim that they have a new prophet somebody who's going to correct all the errors of Christianity, a new American prophet. I mean, this is big news. So I looked into it. And at the time, I was also listening to evangelical apologists on the radio and, and reading some books and magazines by them. And it wasn't very hard for me to rule it out as an option for me. I didn't find this guy credible. I didn't find his claims credible. And some of it seemed to be really coming from left field when it came to their theology. When I was 18, I went off to Biola University, an evangelical Christian university in Southern California. And I don't know if it's still that way, but at the time, students were required to have a, quote, ministry. They were required to do some kind of Christian service. And because I was interested in apologetics and in religion and in clashing religious claims, I somehow found out about this opportunity to be a volunteer at the Ex-Mormons for Jesus Center, which was a short drive away from Biola. Was I qualified to do this? Absolutely not. But they just needed someone to sort of staff the center, to be there in the evenings. And so I did that. I think it was for a semester. It was probably for 10 or 15 weeks total. And they had a very large collection of literature, books, pamphlets, videos, all making the case against Mormonism. And generally speaking, nobody came into the center so a lot of times I would just spend my couple of hours there in the evening looking at some of the videos or the pamphlets and books that they had available to the public. And, you know, some of it was quite devastating. The Book of Mormon is full of stories about big cities and civilizations and goings-on in the New World, and yet there just isn't any confirmation of these claims. In fact, there's a lot to disconfirm them. Archaeologists and historians just flat do not consider the book to be a historical source. And there's the whole issue about the Book of Mormon's view that the Native American tribes are descended from the Israelites, which we now know is false. We know that Native American tribes are closely related to people in Asia, and they must have crossed over the Bering Strait in Alaska at some point, and they're not at all related to Semitic peoples like the Hebrews. So I was learning about this and occasionally finding out a few things about how Mormons try to argue back. They try to fasten on some aspect of archaeology in the New World and suggest that there's a connection there to the Book of Mormon. But it never pans out. In general, religious claims can be pretty hard to vet. 
It's not that way in Mormonism because it's so recently founded and there's just such a wealth of historical information about what went down in the early years. And also its claims are very checkable because of all the historical claims that are made in the Book of Mormon. When I was there in this ex-Mormons for Jesus center, I started to see the darker side of apologetics that deals with Mormonism, what Mormons call anti-Mormon literature. Sometimes the writings arguing against Mormonism had an aggressive, abusive, self-righteous quality. Sometimes they would break into all caps. Sometimes they just seemed like they were being needlessly offensive. I remember one pamphlet criticizing Mormon views about God and about Jesus. It had a Jesus on the cover with glowing red eyes that looked like he was a demon in disguise. And it was about how you've got the wrong Jesus, this Jesus can't save, and it's like you're worshiping this demon Jesus. And I understood the rhetoric, but I thought it was a little over the top. And because I was studying philosophy at the time, I realized that there's a whole world of scholarly literature that's not polemical, or at least not polemical in a bad sense. You can argue against something without going for the low blow. You can argue against something without seizing on little offhand comments or exaggerating claims or just mocking obviously mockable things. It's a human instinct that we all have, and it's not a good instinct to try to win an argument by simply humiliating the opponent, by showing that they're just dumb, they're just a loser, they just don't know what they're talking about, they just shouldn't be listened to. It's a kind of power play. It's not good power. It's not the soft person respecting power of reason and argument. It's trying to take somebody down and humiliate them. Instead of a fair boxing match, it's going for the low blow. In any case, I started to realize that a lot of this literature arguing against Mormonism from an evangelical perspective was a little wild, a little bit sometimes unchristian and too aggressive, and in some cases sensationalist. And I started to realize that that approach is just calculated to make Mormons circle the wagons and just completely ignore whatever it is you're saying. And I started to get a sense of their feeling as a persecuted minority in America. Once I was driving cross-country, was coming home from college, I believe, driving from Southern California to Texas, and somewhere, I think it was in Arizona, there was a Mormon visitor center, and it had some murals which depicted Mormon history and things in the Book of Mormon, and I and the people I was with were interested in Mormonism, genuinely interested, and we decided to just have a little look. So, we stopped by there, and we went in and looked, and we weren't there to make trouble or to mock or anything like that. We were just genuinely curious and see what kind of information they were putting out. The only problem was that at the time, I kind of had long hair, and so did two of the people I was with. And so the second we walked in, not dressed very well and without respectable haircuts, as soon as we walked in the door, we were immediately sized up as non-Mormons, possibly there to make trouble. And they sort of watched us like a hawk and kind of got in our face a little bit and uh, seemed very relieved when we were ready to go. <laughs> I never forgot that incident. It showed me just kind of how defensive they feel. They're very conscious about how they're looked at from the outside. And I was coming to learn also that it's just a standard teaching that they have that you are to ignore anti-Mormon material. It's all just vicious slander. There's nothing to it. There's nothing to see there. They're just attacking your faith. They don't care about you. They're just trying to take something precious from you. So just walk away. Of course, if you talk to a Mormon person, very often they will say that they felt a burning in their bosom that confirmed their belief in Mormonism, and they will challenge you to read the Book of Mormon. Of course, it's easy to find a Book of Mormon. They're in used bookstores, garage sales, they're at the library. It's easy to pick one up, and I did when I was a teenager. I had it all through college and grad school, and you know what? I did try to read it, but I have to admit I didn't find it plausible enough to pray for God to confirm it to me, nor did I actually get through the entire book. And the reason I didn't get through it is because it's just not a good read. Years later, I ran across this quote from famous American author Mark Twain from his book Roughing It, Chapter 16, written in 1861. And he actually took a trip out west. This whole book, Roughing It, is like a travelogue with a lot of exaggeration and fiction thrown into it. And he actually stopped by Brigham Young's Utah 
and had a few interactions with the Mormons there, which is interesting. But here is Mark Twain's description from Roughing It of the Book of Mormon, which I think is entirely accurate. He says, quote, All men have heard of the Mormon Bible, but few except the elect have seen it, or at least taken the trouble to read it. I brought away a copy from Salt Lake. The book is a curiosity to me. It is such a pretentious affair, and yet so slow, so sleepy, such an insipid mess of inspiration. It is chloroform in print. If Joseph Smith composed this book, the act was a miracle. Keeping awake while he did it was, at any rate. If he, according to tradition, merely translated it from certain ancient and mysteriously engraved plates, which he declares he found under a stone in an out-of-the-way locality, the work of translating was equally a miracle for the same reason. The book seems to be merely a prosy detail of imaginary history with the Old Testament for a model, followed by a tedious plagiarism of the New Testament. The author labored to give his words and phrases the quaint, old-fashioned sound and structure of our King James translation of the scriptures. And the result is a mongrel, half-modern glibness and half-ancient simplicity and gravity. The latter is awkward and constrained, the former natural, but grotesque by the contrast. Whenever he found his speech growing too modern, which was about every sentence or two, he ladled in a few such scriptural phrases as, exceeding sore, and it came to pass, etc., and made things satisfactory again. And it came to pass was his pet. If he had left that out, his Bible would have been only a pamphlet. End quote. The Book of Mormon, then, I could easily put down and decide to read other things. And I determined that the overall case against Mormonism is just really overwhelming. On the blog post for this episode, I'll link a video which goes through the top 10 evidential problems that they face. Even just a few of those are enough, I think, to make the case against the reliability of Joseph Smith. But even if I'm not considering it as something that I might believe, the whole story of Mormonism, though, is absolutely fascinating. It's one of the great stories in American history. Someday, somebody's going to make an incredible movie or an incredible Ken Burns-style documentary series about it. The story of its history and the ongoing drama within it is something I can't put down. When the Trinity's podcast returns, an influential biography of Joseph Smith. Part 2. No Man Knows My History That phrase was taken from a so-called autobiography written by the supposed prophet Joseph Smith. Historians say about this autobiography that there's remarkably little history in it. Happily, the sources for a biography of Joseph Smith are copious. Everything from letters to testimony to court records to his own writings, there's just a wealth of information for a historian to work with. Sometime in the early 2000s, I finally got around to reading the classic biography. This is called No Man Knows My History, The Life of Joseph Smith, and it's by a historian named Fawn Brody. The first version of it was published way back in 1945. She was, at the end of her life, a professor of history at UCLA in California. She died at the age of 65 in 1981. And she's a much-respected author of biographies. She wrote Thomas Jefferson, An Intimate History, and then this book, A Biography of Joseph Smith, Thaddeus Stevens and Sir Richard Burton, and at the end of her life, Richard Nixon, The Shaping of His Character. She was raised Mormon in Utah, but she drifted away from her Mormon beliefs while in college and graduate school, and she married a non-Mormon. And this is an absolutely classic book. I had been made aware of it years before, that it was a good biography, and also that Mormons were directly told not to read it. Or at least, by the 70s, 80s, and 90s, that was the church's approach to her book. In 1946, an official church magazine had said that the biography was, quote, of no interest to Latter-day Saints who have correct knowledge of the history of Joseph Smith, end quote. Another publication around that time 
praised her book's, quote, fine literary style, but also described it as, quote, a composite of all anti-Mormon books that have gone before, end quote. Directly fighting it, of course, would give it power. So the first instinct was to dismiss it as obviously irrelevant and a poor production all around, except for the writing. Again, let's just issue a loud yawn. Oh, we've heard this before. It's just more of the same. And you have to throw in the signal that it's anti-Mormon. This, as an insider, tells you to shut your mind off and not worry about it. Of course, there were people interested in apologetics within Mormonism. A BYU professor and LDS historian Hugh Nibley put out a little pamphlet called No Ma'am, That's Not History, but it wasn't a serious challenge. The church excommunicated her, but she was happy with what she'd done and, of course, never repented from it. She felt bad, of course, about what it would do to her parents and maybe some of her other relatives. She once wrote to them, quote, You brought us all up to revere the truth, which is the noblest ideal a parent can instill in his children. And the fact that we come out on somewhat different roads certainly is no reflection on you. I was really pleased about how well it was written, and the way I took it was that it was just utterly devastating as a verdict on the character of Joseph Smith. And what made it devastating is that there's not a snotty, nasty sentence in the entire thing. What she does is just very workmanlike describe the things that he said and the things that he did. And it doesn't require any editorializing. It doesn't require any denouncing. It really just all speaks for itself. That's the strength of the book. She instinctively knew that a firebrand attack would just bounce off the backs of Mormons. And I don't even think that that was her main intention, to bring down Mormonism, at least not as far as I know. I believe that she was curious and interested in where this came from, and the book does a very nice job. It later came out in a revised edition, and it's an excellent read. I think that for a general reader who's genuinely interested in the life of Joseph Smith and in the founding of the Mormon religion, this book is still probably the best place to start. There's a link on the blog post for this episode where you can actually access the PDF of the revised version of No Man Knows My History from archive.org. There is one criticism that some people have lodged against this book, and I think there's something to it. Fawn Brody doesn't really bring us into the real mindset and the motivations of Joseph Smith. It makes sense that somebody who I believe didn't have any religious belief herself would find this aspect of his life confusing and difficult, and so she prefers to focus on his outward actions, the things that he said and the things that he did, without trying to get into his head. Since her work, other people have argued the case that he's to be understood as a pious fraud, so not a cynical liar, not somebody who's just in it for the money, power, and sex, but somebody who had convinced himself that he was on God's side and that his being on God's side, justified systematic deception. I think that makes sense. When Joseph Smith is writing in his journals and praying, he's not doing that for the public, we assume. Of course, this doesn't really excuse him or make him not a liar and deceiver. It makes him an unusual kind. He was a deceiver with religious motives. On the blog post, I'll put a link for someone who is arguing that he's to be understood as a pious deceiver. I think he makes a pretty decent case. Of course, Fawn Brody's is not the only biography of Joseph Smith. In 2005, Dr. Richard Bushman published Joseph Smith, Rough Stone Rolling. At the time he published this, he was a professor emeritus from Columbia University. Dr. Bushman, unlike Brody, was, and I understand is, a member in good standing of the LDS Church. I found out about this book through a podcast, which I'll tell you about later. But at 740 pages, this book does surpass Brody in thoroughness. History is a field that makes progress, and there is more detail here, I think, on almost all aspects of Smith's life. I'll admit, though, that some bits that I've read of this seem disturbingly apologetic. For instance, his account of Joseph Smith's many marriages, or I should say, quote, marriages, celestial marriages. He does, I think, kind of massage and spin things in an apologetic, defensive direction. On the other hand, he just straightforwardly admits quite a few of what you would think are embarrassing details, the kind of things that you wouldn't find in a Sunday school summary. Bushman, as a good historian, typically tells it straight. Here's his account of the death 
of Joseph Smith. Quote, In Carthage, the friendly jailer had moved the prisoners into his own upstairs bedroom, a room without bars on the windows. Joseph spent Thursday, June 27th, preparing for the treason trial scheduled for Saturday. He gave a long list of witnesses to Cyrus Wheelock, who earlier in the day had smuggled in a six-shooter in his overcoat. John Fulmer had previously given Joseph a single-shot pistol, which he passed along to Hiram. In mid-afternoon, according to a familiar story, John Taylor sang, A Poor Wayfaring Man of Grief, whether all 14 verses or not is not recorded, and then sang it again. Hiram read extracts from Josephus. At four, a new set of eight men replaced the afternoon guard, while the main body of Carthage Greys camped a quarter of a mile away on the public square. Late in the afternoon, the jailer's boy told the prisoners the guards wanted wine. William Richards gave him a dollar. When the wine was returned, the prisoners, their spirits dull and heavy, all partook. The guard turned to leave with the bottle. At the top of the stairs, someone called him two or three times, and he went down. The prisoners heard rustling and cries, then three or four shots. Looking through the curtain from the second-story bedroom window, William Richards saw a hundred armed men around the door. Men ran up the stairs and shots were fired through the open windows. The four men in the room sprang for their weapons. Joseph for the six-shooter, Hiram for the single shot, Richards and Taylor for canes. As they threw their weight against the door, musket balls from the landing punched through. Hiram was the first to fall. The ball through the door struck him on the left side of the nose, throwing him to the floor. Three more balls entered his thigh, torso, and shin, killing him. John Taylor was hit in the thigh and fell against the windowsill, breaking his watch. Crawling toward the bed, he was struck again in the hip. Joseph pulled the trigger six times into the hall, dropped the pistol on the floor, and sprang to the window. With one leg over the sill, he raised his arms in the Masonic sign of distress. A ball from the doorway struck his hip, and a shot from the outside entered his chest. Another hit under the heart, and a fourth his collarbone. He fell outward, crying, O oh Lord, my God! Landing on his left side, he struggled to sit up against the curb of a well and died within seconds. Richards raised his head above the sill far enough to see that Joseph was dead and then returned to help John Taylor. Taylor's watch had stopped at 16 minutes past five. End quote. When the Trinity's podcast returns, a sort of story time. The first episode of the Mormon Stories podcast came out on September 4th, 2005. I don't remember when I first heard this podcast. It might have been around 06 or 07. But I was immediately impressed. And this was before podcasting was cool. The thing that impressed me about the podcast was its host and creator, John DeLynn. I believe at the time he was working in computers. He was working for Microsoft, if I remember right. And I think in the early days of podcasting, you had to have some technical ability to actually get the RSS feed working and be able to upload things properly. We didn't have iTunes and other things like WordPress integration that we have now. Anyway, the first time I heard it, I was really impressed. It seemed like the host, John DeLynn, was a Mormon. I mean, sociologically, he was definitely a Mormon. He had been born and raised into it. He'd gone on mission. You could always tell that he had an affection for Mormon people, for Mormon culture, for this particular tribe. But he would be interviewing somebody who had just gone from Mormonism to atheism, or somebody who was studying historical information about the founding of Mormonism and starting to lose their faith, or people who went on mission experience and had a bad time of it, people who saw unethical behavior, or people who started to question their faith at what should have been a high point in their religious life. And the whole thing was very respectful, gentle, non-threatening, and interesting. It was through this podcast that I found out about Dr. Richard Bushman and his now-standard biography of Joseph Smith, Rough Stone Rolling. 
Sometime around this same time, South Park came out with an episode where they mocked Joseph Smith and his supposed translation of the Book of Mormon, talking about this famous incident where the wife of his assistant confiscated one of his translated books and refused to give it back. And rather than just retranslating it, he said that God was very displeased and he wasn't going to translate it again, and he did another book instead, which of course was highly suspicious. about, Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris, can you keep a secret? Well, sure I can. I have, in my possession, an ancient book written on gold plates that tells of Jesus Christ's second coming, here, in America. In America? Really? That sounds kind of... Dum, 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 dum. It's true, and I'm going to translate the plates and publish it into a book for the whole world to read. Mm, I don't know. How do you expect to translate it? With these. Rocks? They're not rocks. They're seer stones, given to me by an angel. With them, God allows me to translate the plates into English. Watch. You take this quill and paper and write down what I say. Sit here. I have the golden plates here in this hat. I need to have them somewhere dark so I can read the spiritual light. Really? Now, when I put the seer stones into the hat, the ancient letters light up and change to English, which I can then read to you. Wow! I'm seeing the light. And that's how the Book of Mormon was written. Dum 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 dum. Dum 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 dum. Dum 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 dum. Dum 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 dum. Martin went home to his wife. Dum 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 dum. And showed her pages from the Book of Mormon. Dum 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 dum. And so Joseph Smith put his head into a hat and, and read to me what the golden plate said. I wrote it all down and we're going to publish it into a book. Martin, how do you know he isn't just making stuff up and pretending he's translating off golden plates? You see, hair is smart, 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 smart. Why would he make it up? Martin Harris, dum da dum. All right, here. I'm gonna hide these pages. If Joseph Smith really is translating off of golden plates, then he'll be able to do it again. But if Joseph Smith is making it all up, then the new translations will be different from these. Okay, fine. I bet he'll have no problem. Lucy Harris, smart, smart, smart. Martin Harris, dumb. So Martin went on back to Smith, said the pages had gone away. Smith got mad and told Martin he needed to go pray. Dum, 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 dum. Look, I'm sorry about losing the pages we worked on, Joe, but I'm ready to write it all down again if you translate from the plates. I would love to, Martin. Except, I just had a vision, and the Lord said he is very angry with me for letting you take those pages. <gasps> he is? Dum, 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 dum. Yes, he is so mad that he will never let me translate from the plate of Lehi again. He said we must now translate from the plate of Nephi. So it will be the same basic story, but written a little differently. Wow! If God got angry with you, then you must be telling the truth! Dum 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 dum! Alright, Martin, let's get to work! I'm not a big South Park fan, but a lot of people had seen this episode and I saw it through the internet. And doing some digging, I found out that, yeah, they had oversimplified the story, but basically it was true. Well, they would discuss things like this. And the witnesses who swore that they saw the plates and that the whole thing was authentic and so on. It was a really bold and brave podcast, and it was well done. And I couldn't keep up with it. I'm a busy professor. I'm not a Mormon. But occasionally I would catch it and find out some more good episodes. Incredibly, they're up to episode number 657. So judging by John DeLynn, I'm just a rank amateur at all of this. I even had a little bit of email correspondence with him. I asked him a few questions about what he was doing. I noticed that they wanted to face this information about Joseph Smith honestly and not just slander the authors or pretend that it doesn't exist. At the same time, sometimes he and his guests would say that, you know, he was just a human, he's a real person, warts and all. It wasn't because they were dishonest or cowardly. They were, in fact, brave people, I think and uh, people with a lot of obvious virtues, but they were conflicted. And I remember I had a little correspondence with him about the idea of religious anti-realism. 
In the last 150 years in Christianity, there have been a steady drip of people who like Christianity, who want to remain Christians, who still identify with it, but they want to say that its value doesn't have to do really with its being true. Its value is aesthetic, cultural, sociological, gives you a nice set of holidays, some pleasant meetings, some nice music, some edifying stories. This perspective that the value of religion does not depend on the truth of its claims is called religious anti-realism. And I realized he was flirting with it, and I let him know that philosophers of religion had discussed this and some other things that he was interested in. You know, should we just accept it on faith? Should we just say that uh, this is a mystery, why God would choose to use such a flawed character to restore the true church? And sometimes they would engage with elements of Mormon apologetics, that whole scene. But that's not the kind of stuff they were doing. It wasn't sort of the corporate lawyer's steely defense of all things traditional, all things on the right side. It was way more complicated than that and way more interesting than that, really. But though they discussed a lot of difficult things, the show was still pitched to be friendly to those who are traditional Mormons in their belief, to those who are deciding what to be, trying to process some of this disturbing information, and to ex-Mormons, to people who are just gone. They're out the door. They've left it behind. In many cases, those are atheists or agnostics. Once you've been fooled by religion... There's a strong human tendency to react hard the other way and to throw out, in my opinion, the baby with the bathwater. As for Delin himself, he's obviously a smart, compassionate, nice person, and a very good interviewer, someone who's pleasant to listen to. But of course, I wondered what his views really were. And generally, he didn't get into it when I was listening to him early on. Since then, it's become clear to make a long story short, that he is really an ex-Mormon. He quit his job in computer science and earned a PhD in clinical and counseling psychology from Utah State University. What he's doing now is really leading a movement of people, an exodus of people out of Mormonism, people who love certain things about their culture, and yet who really disagree with the church's teachings and maybe with its politics. The more I listened to Dr. DeLynn, it became clear that on all moral and societal questions, he was a straight-down-the-line progressive. The kind of person that thinks The Daily Show with Jon Stewart was the greatest thing to ever hit television. Not that I know he's into that. Frankly, he seems like a nicer person than Jon Stewart. But he was taking up all the progressive causes of gay rights and gay marriage and so on, and that was part of his passion. I also realized that he was organizing get-togethers and events and that he had a hope of making some type of Unitarian Universalist type of thing, a place for ex-Mormons to land that's not simply atheism, but has the social aspect of religion, and I think the political and moral aspects of contemporary progressivism, some place for them to land that's like another church, like another denomination, like another little society. Because of this, my interest has waned a little bit. But I was interested recently to hear an episode where Dr. DeLynn talks about his own beliefs. Back in July 2016, for episode 642, Dr. DeLynn did an Ask Me Almost Anything session on Facebook Live. He sounds a bit out of breath here because he's going very quickly through a lot of questions that people are firing away at him in this forum. And he gets this question about his own beliefs. You've been careful about not exposing too much about your feelings on God. What stage of evolution is your theology at right now? I just did an Infants on Thrones podcast about this where they called me a reluctant atheist. It's also fair to say that Scott Gordon of a Fair Mormon uh, recently was uh, traveling through Europe and what I believe was an attempt to smear or discredit or malign Mormon stories. He basically said that um, he's known me for a long time, which is not true, and that I haven't believed in God in a very long time, which is not true, at least not from my perspective. Now, there's nuance here, but I think it's safe to say that I lost my faith in an anthropomorphic God, probably 2000, 2001. I just found too much suffering in the world, too much confusion to, uh, to ever really be able to get behind the idea that there's an anthropomorphic God. So some big male personage with the beard in the sky who's listening to us, who's an exalted being, 
who's answering every prayer and blessing us with the things that we need. I'm just not seeing a reason to believe in that today. And if I swing to the other side, I've had to realize that there's a decent chance that God and religion is just a human creation, that we created the idea of God to help make ourselves feel better. I mean, I think that's possible. I've had to come to a place of comfort with the possibility that this is the only life we have and that there is no afterlife and that there is no God. If that happens to be the case, I like to think that I'm okay with that. I'll be sad. won't make me thrilled to have this life end because I love this life. It'll make me sad to think that I won't see people that I love later. And I guess if I'm dead, I won't know the difference. But still, I feel like I'm okay day to day believing that there may not be an afterlife. Having said that, I did take umbrage at Scott Gordon characterizing me as an atheist for a very long time. Because the truth is, while there have been moments of doubt and sadness, my faith in God has fluctuated over the years. And of course, when I say God, I I use that term very loosely. When I talk about God now, some type of power, some type of force, some type of influence, some type of higher purpose, energy, spirit. I don't even know. I don't even know what God means anymore. All I can say is that there's a part of me that still today hopes that there's an afterlife that has maybe even a little bit of faith that there's some type of existence beyond this life. And if there happens to be some type of God or power, I've got no problem with that as long as that power of being is nice and kind and loving and fair, etc. And this has been my position for a long time, even though maybe occasionally I've really had doubts. So I think my biggest problems with Scott Gordon and Fair Mormon and his talk that he gave was that he was trying to smear Mormon stories. He claimed to know me when he really didn't. He mischaracterized me in saying that he's known me, which is not true, that I haven't believed in God for a long time, which is not true, even though my my beliefs have gone up and down. And basically, he didn't show the empathy that I would have hoped someone in his position would show. I would hope that someone who's been at Fair Mormon for that long would understand how sensitive a faith crisis is, would understand that faith goes up and down, would understand that Mormon stories is and was a sincere effort to tell all sides of an issue and to share And that he treated that opportunity glibly, he treated it with a sneer, and I hope he won't do that anymore. And right now, I call upon Fair Mormon to stop smearing people. Talk about the issues on the merits of the issues. If somebody's in pain or struggling or created a podcast or a blog, try and speak about them in a way to where you understand that they have pain, that they have legitimate issues, that people are motivated to do these sorts of podcasts and interviews because they see divorces happening, they see suicides happening, they see pain and suffering happening, and they want to be a part of the solution. Stop mischaracterizing people. Stop making false claims about people. And instead, show empathy and support and love. And we can disagree about things, but we can be kind about it. So anyway, that's my answer about God. I still consider myself a believer of sorts, although many people say that they would call my beliefs agnosticism. And I don't really even care. I'm just telling you I have a faith and a hope that there's something in the afterlife, that there may be some power or influence. I call that God, and that way I'm a believer. But that's on a good day. On a bad day, I'm questioning and maybe feeling like there's nothing. And I should be able to have those feelings and thoughts without Scott Gordon or anyone else uh, smearing me or trying to label me as an atheist so that they can discredit Mormon stories so that people in Europe won't listen to Mormon stories. I think that's a bad call. When some of my clients ask me for resources to help them stay in the church, I give them Fair Mormon as a reference. I actually link to Fair Mormon and send people the link to Fair Mormon, if their desire is to stay in the church and to believe. Because I want to show respect to Fair and for people who do that. I just would like the same type of courtesy from from them. An interesting answer. Here's my analysis as a philosopher of religion. He strongly disavows belief in, quote, an anthropomorphic God, end quote. I'm not sure what he means by that. The way he stated it in his haste was, you know, a man in the sky with a beard. That's real anthropomorphism. Anthropomorphism is talking about or thinking about something that's not a human as if it were a human. So real anthropomorphism is thinking about God as if he's, you know, six foot two, 200 pounds, maybe with brown hair, blue eyes, that type of thing. Maybe up in the sky in orbit. Now, admittedly, Mormons do believe that God has a body, but if the problem of evil is really what's motivating Dr. DeLynn, what about a non-bodily spirit who's all-knowing, all-powerful, and perfectly good? I think when he talks about not believing in a, quote, anthropomorphic deity, 
I think he would count a mind, a spirit, a non-physical being as anthropomorphic as well. In other words, what he's disavowing is the idea of God as a self, a being for whom you would use personal pronouns, a being that could communicate and be communicated to, a being with whom one might have, in a certain sense, friendship, although not a friendship of equals. God, with a capital G, is generally assumed to be a God, a mighty self. What he said was that he believes that there isn't a being like that, although he hopes that there is a, quote, God in some sense. In my view, that makes him an atheist. Why is it that he doesn't want to accept the label atheist? I think it's because in his mind, a, quote, atheist is also what philosophers call a naturalist, someone who thinks that the natural world is all that there is. True, in our culture, in our place and time, the term atheist does often stand as shorthand for naturalistic atheism. There isn't a god, the god of monotheism is fictional, and there isn't anything like that. There isn't anything that's not physical. There isn't anything that ultimately is outside the subject matter of physics. Is he a naturalistic atheist? It seems not. So I can understand why he takes umbrage at being called an atheist. In the context of a discussion among Mormons, or people questioning Mormonism, to call somebody an atheist is to cast them as an outsider and somebody who's against everything they stand for, and someone who's taken the anti-religious side in the American culture wars. To call yourself an atheist is to kind of fly that flag also. The Richard Dawkins flag. Okay, so he's not an atheist in that sense. Is he an atheist in that he thinks there isn't a god? Yes, he is an atheist in that sense. He doesn't think that there's a perfect creator of the heavens and the earth who's provident over human history, indeed over all of history, who's going to someday judge people based on their deeds and reward his friends with eternal life and damn his enemies. He doesn't believe in that. And he's not just an agnostic who's in a little bit of doubt about it. He thinks there isn't a being like that. So he's an atheist, but he's not a naturalistic atheist. There are lots of atheists that aren't naturalistic atheists. He's not a naturalist, we know, because he thinks maybe, he hopes, and maybe sometimes thinks that there's a higher something. He means, I think, something beyond the physical world, something outside the subject matter of even a perfected physics. He hopes that there's an afterlife. He's not convinced that there's no afterlife. There are all kinds of religious people in the world who believe in a higher something which isn't a god, which doesn't have knowledge, will, and intentions, you find this kind of idea of an impersonal ultimate in Taoism, in Advaita Vedanta Hinduism, in Mahayana Buddhism, and just among any person who says, I believe in God, but not in a personal God. One thing I would comment on is the grounds for his atheism, or as he says, disbelief in an anthropomorphic God. He says that there's just too much evil. Well, how much evil would a perfect being allow? This is something that philosophers have thought quite a lot about and written quite a lot about. And I have the feeling that his turn to atheism is more kind of a gut level reaction. I would say it's good to read some of the philosophy on this for anybody who's wrestling with how could God exist if there is evil in the world? Is it just the existence of any evil at all in the world that's the problem? It's hard to see, actually, how that's inconsistent with the existence of God. Or is it really the amount of evil? I mean, how much evil would a perfect being allow? That's not obvious. And that issue, it seems, cries out for some really hard thinking. On the other hand, it might be particular types of evil that you find troubling. Not just any evil, but maybe the suffering of innocence or animal pain or something like this. Philosophers have discussed how believers in God have a harder time explaining the allowance of some kinds of evil rather than others. Another big issue here is whether or not there could be gratuitous evil in a universe where God exists. Gratuitous evil is evil that's not logically required for the occurrence of some great good or for the prevention of some great evil. If you believe in God and you're wrestling with this question of evil, I've got a few links for you on the blog post for this episode that can get you started. I suggest that a gut reaction, an emotional response, untutored by serious investigation, is not the safest way to go. 
Dr. DeLynn also mentions his idea that maybe religion is just a human creation. Maybe it's plausible that for some psychological reason, we felt the need to posit a big daddy in the sky. This is an interesting objection to belief in God. I agree, actually, about this with the late great philosopher of religion, William Rowe, who, by the way, was an atheist. I agree with him that this sort of objection doesn't really get us anywhere when it comes to belief in God. I've got a link on the blog post to a video lecture of mine where I discuss the Freudian type objection and explain why it doesn't really get us anywhere. I was also interested by his confessing to giving out the website of a Mormon apologetics organization to people that he's counseling who are thinking about remaining in the church and keeping their beliefs. On the face of it, that's a nice thing to do. At least it's being fair. It's letting people hear all sides of the argument. On the other hand, I can't help wonder if it has to do with what I mentioned before, which is a kind of religious non-realism or religious anti-realism. This is where you just don't think that the value of religion consists in the truth of its claims or the truth of its teachings. Obviously, like any normal and any educated person, he doesn't want to believe false things. And he's a little bit sore that people were telling him a cleaned up version of the story of the founding of Mormonism and the life of Joseph Smith. Nobody wants to believe falsehoods about important things. On the other hand, I think he's very aware of the good that religious belonging does people, and he's reluctant to let go of it all. I'm not sure that if I were counseling a person like that, I would send them to a website of apologists. Apologists can be pretty dishonest characters when they want to be. It really depends on the apologists. Sometimes they are rather intellectually honest, but human nature being what it is, very often they're not. In any case, I think it shows confidence in one's belief when you encourage people to check out what the opposition is saying. If your case is strong, you're willing to do that. In any case, for my part, I would say thanks to Dr. John DeLynn for his podcast, for his courage, and for his honesty. I think a lot of Mormons, questioning Mormons, and ex-Mormons appreciate what he does, and his willingness to follow the evidence when it wasn't at all convenient to him or to his family. The reason that the Mormon Stories podcast is still going is because it's very popular. And the reason it's very popular is because information about the life of Joseph Smith and early Mormon history is just all over the internet now, and it really can't be avoided. And there are quite a few smart, educated, fundamentally honest Mormons that are finding out about this when they're in high school or in college particularly. So there's a big audience for what he's doing. Next week on the Trinity's podcast, you're going to hear from two very interesting insider sources. People who have been bold enough to pull back the curtain and reveal the real man behind the legend of Joseph Smith. And I'll also talk about lessons that Christians can draw from this whole affair. See you next week. This week's thinking music has been the track Smiles by Jesse Spillane. If you love the Trinity's podcast, please share the podcast on social media. Help us to get the word out on Twitter, Facebook, Pinterest, and so on. Another thing you can do is give us an honest rating and review in the iTunes store for your country. For some directions on how to do this, just go to trinities.org slash blog slash review. You can support the podcast by giving us a one-time or a monthly donation through PayPal. Just look for the orange buttons on the right side of any blog post. Every little bit helps. And if you shop at Amazon.com, enter that website through a blog post. If you do this and then make a purchase, then without increasing your price, we get a small percentage. Lastly, make your voice heard. Give us a comment on the blog post for this episode. Or join our very active Facebook group at Facebook.com slash groups slash Trinities. We're always open to show ideas, guest suggestions, objections, and so on. Sometimes I even respond to feedback in an episode. Don't forget then to share, to rate, to chip in when you can, and to talk back. Thanks for listening. We'll see you online 
at trinities.org. Till next time, don't forget to love God with all your mind.